So uh, when my dad passed away in 2009, um, I was figuring out what to do with his 400 boxes of papers um, that he'd asked me to uh, take care of. And uh, the reason the Kemp Foundation started is because we were able to get his 400 boxes of papers to the Library of Congress, to the Manuscript Division. And the Library of Congress does not do that. They don't take members of Congress's papers. Um, and uh, so that was really what launched the Jack Kemp Foundation. Um, and I'd worked with Dad at a company that we built called Kemp Partners during the 2000s. And uh, I was focused on business. Dad continued to be focused on whatever he wanted to be focused on, um, which was <laughs> one of the, uh, the the comical frustrations of my daily life during the 2000s. Um, but there was a, a book that came out that was really helpful. Uh, af shortly after Dad died, I wanted to read about uh, his political career. And uh, there are a number of good books, but there's one that I read shortly after Dad passed away called Econoclasts, and it was written by our next speaker. It's a history of the supply side revolution. And uh, so Brian Dimitrovich is a professor at, of history at Sam Houston State, um, and he's written a number of books. His latest one is on uh, JFK and the Reagan Revolution, the secret history, oh, I forget the last part of it of American prosperity. Um, <clears throat> we don't believe it's secret, uh, but not enough people understand that connectivity uh, between Kennedy and Reagan. He wrote it with Larry Kudlow, um, and Brian is uh, a friend. He's a, a champion um, for supply-side economics, for classical economics, uh, and we're pleased to have him here to speak to us today. So please welcome Brian Dimitrovich. Thank you very much, uh, Jimmy and Sean and Steve. Thanks for having me. It is great to be here. And I, I never got to meet uh, Jack Kemper or Robert Bartley, but boy, are those guys with me in spirit. Uh, economist Robert Mundell uh, closed his stunning Nobel Prize address, the very last of the 20th century, in December 1999 with these words. Quote, the century closes with an international monetary system inferior to that with which it began but much improved from the situation that existed only two and a half decades ago, the 1970s. It remains to be seen where leadership will come from and whether a restoration of the international monetary system will be compatible with the power configuration of the world economy. It would certainly make a contribution to world harmony." End of quotation. Leadership in the area of the international monetary system would certainly make a contribution to world harmony. We would do well to take heed of this augury of 17 and a half years ago here in 2017 and assess how we have done by its lights. Leadership in the era, area of the international monetary system and its related contribution to world harmony. Now, in terms of economic performance, if not global peace itself, it is uncontroversial to say that the situation today is not only not much improved from the time Mundell spoke at the close of the 20th century, the booming late 1990s, but demonstrably worse. Economic growth rates throughout the 2000s have been far lower than those that prevailed for long stretches both in the 1990s and the 1980s. These growth rates have been so low for so long, struggling to hit even 2%, failing to hit 3% per annum for a dozen years now in this country, that fantastic excuses have come on the scene. We speak not, in general, of flaws in the international monetary system that could be rectified. Rather, we adduce the opioid academic. We mention the playing of video games by men in their adulthood. These are not laugh lines. These are the specific reasons that policymakers are offering currently as to why our growth rates are about half of what they were in the previous generation. Not the international monetary system, but methamphetamines. As for that international monetary system, if we can struggle to find its relevance, could we say that it has shown distinctive signs of order or satisfactoriness in these slow growth years of the 2000s? Have we had a really good system? It's just other things that are killing our growth. 
Well, about as much as can be said for our current system is two things. The first is that, indeed, international trade is kept up at high levels through the 2000s, if down a little bit now, generally. The container stacks on the huge car cargo ships, now an icon of both style and avant-garde design, prove it. You see cargo ships everywhere. True enough, international trade in goods has been fairly booming. The monetary system is not impeding it, at least in aggregate form. Gross trade volumes are fairly high. The second thing that can be said for the international monetary system today is that it is open for business. It is not closed or inaccessible, but overt, even beckoning. What I mean is that traders are so free these days to speculate in the currency markets, Bitcoin excluded, that hedge funds are challenging industry itself as the largest profit pool in the economy as a whole. The international monetary system as it is right now is certainly prone to be played, and you can make and presumably lose a fortune doing it. So trade is up and you can speculate in currencies. These are the positive hallmarks, such as they are, of our current regime. Conversely, what is lacking in our current monetary system, for good or ill? Well, our current mon monetary system certainly gives no birth to fully both of the two classical elements of monetary systems, these two elements being fixity and anchoring. As for fixity, this is the good degree of immutability of exchange rates that had characterized much of the currency system through the heroic periods of the Industrial Revolution over the centuries. Throughout our 2000s, exchange rates have fluctuated in tremendous ranges, China accepted. Against major currencies, the dollar depreciated by a whopping 40% from 2002 to 2011. It has since retraced more than half that degree upward. A 40% swing down against trading partners with economic growth rates about identical to ours, and then a swing back up. This is not to mention the gaping short-term exchange rate shifts among the premier world currencies of the crisis years of 2006 to 9. This was when the euro soared from 125 to 160 in two years' time, then fell back to 125 in the six months following April 2008. The extreme and rapid dollar appreciation in the summer and fall of 08 made a mockery of invoicing trade and particularly valuing assets. And let us remember the latter, the valuing of assets, which is to say the essential term in mark-to-market -market accounting protocols was the specific variable active as the harrowing financial and economic crisis in the fall of that year groped for its depth. So, Fixity is lacking in the monetary system of the 2000s. There are huge swings in exchange rates coincident with economies representing those swinging currencies growing, it would seem incongruously, at the same rate. Exchange rates going like this, growth rates the same. Though perhaps not incongruously, since this rate of economic growth is very slow. As for anchoring, Traditionally, this has meant that currencies maintain a par against some non-currency reference point, something outside the system, a la Kurt Gödel's incompleteness theorem, as George Gilder has been pointing out in recent years. Has there been currency stability against the classic non-currency anchors, commodities in general and gold in particular? Well, of course not. There have been, again, wild swings in non-currency reference points. Commodities have traced and exaggerated the exchange rate swings. Petroleum is the most gaudy example. $12 a barrel in 2000, cruising up to 145 in July of 08. Then in the blink of an eye at $30 that very December, only to sample 110 two and a half years later, and then plunging back into the 30s in 2015. You have to look away from oil and into the gold markets for comparative orderliness. Gold simply moved up from $300 to $1,800 an ounce over the first eight years of the new century, and then settled at $1,200. A ninefold increase in gold, in a, a sixfold increase in gold, in a retreat to a fourfold increase. In previous eras, this sort of news would stop the presses and invite mass public wonderment. Not in our own day. We look at gold to catch a break from the exorbitant trends in the oil market. Then there's copper, whose skyrocketing in the 2000s incited a new form of petty crime, thievery on constru construction sites of sewer innards, electrical wires, and scrap. Uh, there is no anchor and there is no fixity. Currencies do not refer to commodities or gold and they swing without sense of range against each other. There is trade and there is speculation on the positive side. And there is one constant, there is slow growth. The longest bout of it, in fact, in American economic history. 
Could perhaps these various elements be rearranged, these levers pulled in different fashion in procuring a different result? Let it be remembered that the greatest contemporary theory of economic growth, that of economist Paul Romer, has it that the secret to growth lies not in introducing new elements into the system. The secret lies in rearranging and reapplying the current elements. Growth is a function of a recipe, like that in the kitchen. You have all your ingredients, then you figure out how best to combine and apply them. You can mess it up or you can do it right, all with the same ingredients. The trick is to have the right recipe and then apply it. Here is where history proves instructive. We can make the periods of high growth the control, the given. Post-war prosperity, 1945 to 1973. Here was 4% growth per annum with some periods, such as the 1960s, this is what Larry and I read about in JFK and the Reagan Revolution, clocking 5% for the long term, nine years in a row. Then the 1980s and 1990s, growth of 3.5% with two long stretches, two series of seven fat years, to use Robert L. Bartley's phrase, at 4.5% per annum. You might then say that this is the first part of the recipe in the kitchen we will target economic growth of that order, attainable and done resplendently in our recent past. Growth at four or five percent at our current two percent. Take that Triffin dilemma, we're gonna have a control. We're gonna have a, it's, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna, that's a given. Everything else will have to change. The next question is to identify the monetary system elements of these two multi-decade booms. In the two great post-war growth periods, all that was done is fixity and anchoring were sampled in a different fashion in each case. Let's learn from that. During post-war prosperity, the quarter century after 1945, we had fixity without a great deal of anchoring in the true sense. And from 1982 to 2000, we had anchoring without much fixity. It appears that even a nod in the direction of one element of classical monetary systems fixity or anchoring, is enough to correspond with something like double the real rate of economic growth that we have been able to muster in these 2000s. Just try fixity or anchoring and you grow at heroic rates. Post-war prosperity, the Bretton Woods era, was the era of fixity. By rule and convention in the 50s, currencies traded at fixed rates. Now these rates at times changed under the, uh, the de facto or de jure supervision of the IMF. But in almost every case involving major currencies, the exception was Britain, the exchange rate revisions served to depreciate the dollar in small doses as recovering major economies grew at hyperbolic rates such as Japan's 10% per year in the 60s. The degree of these revisions would not even be noticeable given the magnitude of exchange rate shifts today. We are given to think that there was a fairly firm anchor in the post-war world, gold, which the United States had to surrender on demand from, author to, from a forward authority at $35 per ounce. By the way, one point on that, um, about Fort Knox and Harry Dexter White. Fort Knox, let's remember, was, was fiat money. Uh, Fort Knox was created by an executive order by the gold confiscation of 1933, which is the definition of a fiat action. So I, I often think that we should consider the gold in Fort Knox as fiat money. If it were sold off and made part of the public gold markets, then it could be considered non-fiat money. Just a thought. The thing is about gold in the 50s and 60s is the United States gained the private gold market in redemption requests so much through the gold pool in London, through Operation Twist, through export credits, diplomatic suasion, and so forth, that the anchor was more of a shadow anchor, a ghost, as Robert Mundell might say. Professor Mundell has long called the euro the ghost of the mark, and was paid certain respects, gold was, and served as a talisman more than it directed monetary policy. There was fixity, that's clear, and monetary policy was conducted more effectively than perhaps intentionally, but effectively enough such that the fixed rate system endured. I think that's the answer to the Triffin dilemma question. Monetary policy effectively ceded its independent to exchange rate fixity. All this was co coincident with the most beloved rates of economic growth of all time, that of post-war prosperity. Of course, all this blew up in the 1970s. First, there was the elimination of that ghost, the going off gold in 1971. Then fixity itself gave up the ghost in 1973. And we had the anchor-free, fixity-free, fancy-free era of 1973 to 82. This was the justly mocked stagflation period, a ludicrous run of three recessions, two of them double dip, 
double-digit inflation, budget deficits in the context of bracket creep in the tax code, and the flight of capital out of real enterprises and into currency hedges, leaving upwards of 11 million Americans stranded unemployed. So the tally throughout history, recent history, as we build the monetary system economic growth recipe is fixity with the ghost of an anchor, and you get post-war prosperity. The dispatching of the anchor, the dispatching of fixity, you get stagflation. That's the beginning. We're beginning to build our recipe. And then the next era, 1982 to 2000. Here we continued with the major exchange rate movements of the 70s, but in the other direction. The dollar, which got killed in the 70s, powered up against the strongest currencies, peaking in 1985, as Secretary Baker has reminded us, and then went down, then up in the Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton Republican Congress years. There was no fixity, but graph paper surpassing moves in central exchange rates in the 1980s. Jack Kemp, Professor Mundell, and Senator Bradley convened conferences to try to reform this palpably unbecoming aspect of the international monetary system. What was distinctive about the monetary system, the de facto monetary system, the order, maybe then the system, I think Mundell would say, there's a kind of an order that actually exists and you can bless it with a system if you want to, but the order of the Reagan-Clinton-Gingrich boom was that there was anchoring, arguably more of it than at any time since World War I, Bretton Woods included. The United States did not set up a gold pool. The Fed did not do the twist. There were no grand agreements not to ask for gold from the United States and so on. Rather, the private price of gold fairly parked at $350 an ounce for 18 years. Oil, almost as if it could not believe what was happening, fell from its $39 peak in 1980, first into the 20s, then settled in the $12 to $15 range for the duration. The rest of the commodities universe followed suit and flatlined low. Was there targeting in domestic policy of these non-systemic reference points? Well, effectively there was, because commodities were low and stable. I find it hard to believe that there was not deliberateness on this score. Again, this is my answer to the Triffin dilemma, outsourced monetary policy to anchors and the exchange rate. My hunch is that the Fed was so embarrassed in the 1980s to admit that it was taking cues from gold as the great moderation roared that it created a paper trail of academic theories it was following to create the impression that the developments in the gold market were a mere effect. My specific hypothesis is that a reason such enthusiasm was shown for the Taylor role, rule, the Taylor rule, when it made its debut in the 1990s, is that Professor Taylor's rule provided plausible deniability for the Fed as it strove to create the false impression that it had prudently given up paying attention to gold. That's a speculation of mine, but I'm doing some archival research on it. Um, I think we have paid a price for this gamesmanship. We never wrote down the recipe and admitted to it and posted it on the refrigerator because we never admitted it was the recipe. But in any event, let one thing be clear. There was a currency anchor effectively in the 1980s and 1990s, and we got booming growth. 40 million new jobs and the permanent collapse of the 1970s inflation, 15-fold increase in the stock market, startups upending the Fortune 500. So returning to our tally, it reads out as this, fixity with the ghost of an anchor, post-war prosperity. The dispatching of the anchor with fixity following, stagflation. Anchor without fixity, great moderation, 1980s, 1990s. Dispatching of anchor and fixity again, exception China, slow growth new millennium. It would appear that an effort to have fixed exchange rates with an anchor would yield wonderful economic results. It is hard to read our recent history and see it providing pointers toward any other recipe. Indeed, our history implies that if we strove for both fixity and an anchor, we might even achieve higher rates of growth than in the good eras of the recent past, because the, these eras really only tried one element. We could do better than post-war prosperity. Professor Mundell year, has yearned for leadership on this score. He did as he accepted the Nobel Prize in 1999 speaking of how monetary reform had to respect the power configuration of the world economy. Clearly, this means that the United States and its co-equals must lead. In earlier writings, Professor Mundell's metaphor of choice was leading the convoy. He spoke of how the flagship left the convoy when the pound sterling abandoned gold in 1931, the Japanese incursion into Manchuria coming just a few weeks later. Mundell has spoken of the convoy and the flagships in his various debates with economists, including Jacques Rueff and in Williamsburg in 1983. 
The major economy chooses an anchor in fixity, and the convoy of the global economy follows with beautiful real results. Let me then infer what we might do today. First, recognize that the United States has the obligations of leadership. Second, establish a line, a convoy of orienting monetary policy, I said domestic monetary policy, towards fixity and an anchor in the exchange rate markets. And third, watch as others follow the lead while expecting a run of fantastic global prosperity. Such a course of action, to coin a phrase, might well make a contribution to world harmony. Thank you. We're going to keep it moving, but time for a couple of questions. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Alex Kibola. I'm with the Joint Economic Committee. Uh, so I had a question in going to an anchor. I, I, I see I'm somewhat new to the supply side monetary school of thought. And it seems that the exchange rate is an intermediate target in this sense. So for, for somewhat of a domestic monetary policy, does each nation adopting a price level target or an NGDP target, what, uh, in that context, what happens to the exchange rate regime internationally? Yeah, I think following Mundell, the first thing is for the leading country to lead. That, that has to happen. I mean, a, a, a small country cannot just fix to gold when gold's going like this uh, in the major currency unit. So the United States has to lead. If the United States leads and says, we are going to have a currency anchor, uh, you will very quickly develop the conditions where you can have fixed exchange rates. Um, I think that's what uh, Secretary Baker was, that was the, the highest aspiration of the, of the Plaza Louvre era. Okay, we have fixity in the commodities markets now, so why don't we just add on fixed exchange rates, and then we can just have this thing run forever. Last one, Nathan. Um, as you mentioned, uh, the great moderation period, which was the best period of the floating fiat era since 1971, uh, coincided with the dollar being quite stable against gold. And of course, we all know gold was, uh, Greenspan was a gold guy in the 60s. Um, we always wondered whether he was doing, doing that on purpose or whether it was just sort of an accidental outcome. Uh, but he does seem to have made a number of statements recently reaffirming earlier statements that he made when he was governor that indeed he was very intentionally trying to keep the dollar stable versus gold using the Keynesian interest rate targeting regime that he was stuck with at the time. Um, I wonder if, you, if, you've, if you've noticed some of these comments and uh, if thinking, our understanding of his history is, is improving along those lines. Yeah, I, I have seen some of those com comments, Nate, and they're fascinating. I've looked a little bit at the Fed minutes. The Fed minutes, of course, are kind of uh, the, the propagandistic uh, arm of the Fed. So Chuck had like an art laugher in 1982, and John, you may have been involved in this too. I wrote a series of articles in the Wall Street Journal uh, saying, we've just discovered the new secret of monetary policy. And this, of course, is when the Dow went up 30 percent from uh, August 1982 through the end of the year and beginning the bull market. And so every time gold went up in the private markets, the Fed tightened immediately. And every time it went down, they loosened. And uh, that's what they're doing. Um, it, it, they're developed academic papers about the Taylor Rule and everything within eight to ten years' time, and then they backcast. You know, the, that's the famous argument of John Taylor is that look, they were following the Taylor Rule before it happened, and the Fed very gratefully appropriated that wisdom in the early 1990s, so it could give them kind of cover. And I'm wondering why they're running away from it. You know, because I guess uh, muddling through, by the way, is better than the PhD standard. Because the one thing if you say all I do is follow the gold price, then what you know, what do you need that PhD for? Yeah, okay.